Greetings, students. So we've kind of started the class by thinking about what could magic be? What is religion? What is science? But now we're moving into the very specifics of what is magic. And we're looking at the specific context of magic in Greek cultures. We've been doing up to this point. However, in this lecture, we're going to be looking at philia as opposed to eros. Philia gives a general sort of good vibe in men toward, presumably, for the most part, women or their social inferiors. So again, as we're thinking about magic, we're not just looking at the rituals. It's important to look at the rituals. We're thinking about the social context of our operator, the one who does the ritual, of what's going on in the ritual actions of the operation and the, the apparatus, if you will. And we're thinking about the targets and the victims and what is their social standing, how all of these come together to show how magic reveals a complicated social history of a time often far separated from us. All right, so let me share my screen and we'll get started today. Share on the screen, share on the screen. I need a mantra to share the screen. I wish I could just say, share my screen, and it'll just happen. Anyway, so the trouble with Philia. So again, we are in the world of Greek love magic. So uh, while for th at this point, we kind of argued that Eros is predominantly done by men <laughs> to affect women, women were their targets or victims. But in fact, Farone tells us that women, females, women were equally adept at a type of magic called philia or agape magic. Now, both words connote, why do I say connote? So we have two types of definitions. You have a connotation, which looks at the various contexts and ways that a word is used, the ways it changes, the way it depends on what the words are around us or the social situation. And you have a denotation, which is a dictionary type of definition. It's prescriptive. It tells you exactly what the word is normatively meant to be without accounting for a lot of usage. So with philia and agape, these terms connote a sort of affection in a spouse, a lover, or some other person to whom the practitioner is already well known. So it's not a general thing. It doesn't like make you generally well disposed or make generally all people well disposed unto you per se. What it does is it would make you as the operator have a man in your life, usually your husband, be well disposed and not angry. Now, this doesn't really inspire the desire to get it on and make a lot of love, though that might be involved in there. It's generally considered to have a different type of love, a, a, an absent of anger and a general favorability is one way that I put it. Now, all this Eros, Agape, male, female stuff, when we get to the last chapter of Ferone, it's all going to get twisted around. And we're going to see that all of this is so much more interesting than we could even begin to think about. But we're really, in this case, looking at philia rituals, rituals of philia love magic that women use against men. Now, the victim, the target, will become docile and amiable. Now, it won't be an aggressive or a painful effect like with arrows, but we have to remember at the same time, these rituals bind, dominate, and debilitate a man. They remove his anger, which is also connected to his sexual desire. They work in a thing like that. Sexual, uh, desi sexual desires and anger work together in Greek culture. So by removing that anger and thereby removing their sexual desire, making them just generally you know, well disposed to people, they're dominating the man. They're subjugating a man using artificially enhanced emotions of affection, which will lessen aggression and, se and sexual or sensual passion. While Eros on our first point uh, that we looked at last time was meant to challenge the ownership of other males toward women, the ownership of other men's relationships for, toward women, these spells undermine the victim, the target's ownership of himself. His own wills and his own desires are tampered with. Now, the literary record and the mythological record and whatnot records a lot of common male suspicion. If there was sort of, they, that men would get really suspicious that their wives or their concubines or their mistresses would use spells to control them to undermine their autonomy. And as I'd said before, 
autonomy and independence is the highest value for Greeks. Now, notably, when we're looking here, we're seeing a lot of spells that are called pharmacon, which if you look that up in our book, means something like magic potions. And regularly, we'll see in these philia spells that the ingredients include narcotics. Now, bewildering and maddening and attracting spells throughout the world often use intoxicants. So this is another what I've been calling a persuasive analogy. May the person who's the victim be intoxicated in their mind as if they had taken this drug that you use in the ritual. Or in the case of a sort of poison pill where you put sort of the, the magic in someone's food or drink, the drug itself being an intoxicant will have an effect. And that effect, and that effect is thought to both enhance and to be enhanced by the magical operation. Now, when we're thinking about rituals, and this is a big point for me, we have to look at the whole darn things. So when I first started really studying South Asian magic in, in India and Sanskrit, I looked across the scholarship on South Asia and on South Asian religions, and there's very little on this magic, these magic rituals. Um, and I didn't know what to do with it, despite the fact that I had all of these texts, so many of them, so few of them translated, fewer even looked at by scholars at this point. So what I had noticed, what was written primarily or, or entirely when they did write about these magic rituals would be just the results. It was like the authors were just thinking about the results of the rituals. I mean, that was easy because they didn't have to figure the rituals out. They didn't have to compare the ritual ingredients. They didn't have to figure out the vocabulary and the complicated ingredients. They just look at the effects. They could figure those out. They could look at them together and be like, okay, these are the effects of magic. So they would also rarely or only vaguely speculate upon the social positions of the operator or the victims. So when we're studying the Greek magic traditions, we can see that authors like Farone have paid attention to every step of the ritual, the social component, the ritual activities, the ingredients, the effects, all of the above. So when I started studying these Greek magic traditions, looking to figure out what to do with the Indian stuff, I discovered a model for how to study Indian magic. So what we have, what I want you to be really clear on is this idea of imagination that I keep coming to. All elements of any ritual must be accounted for. And you need to imagine them. You need to imagine everything going on, the full ritual process to make an interpretation. You have to think about the place, the invocations, the words, the ritual, the ritual actions, the ritual ingredients, and sight, smell, touch, everything. And as you do that, you will see that important details in each part of the ritual will nuance not only the overall meaning of the ritual, but the effects. You can't really understand the nuances of the effects just by looking at the declared effects. There's more to it. We'll get more into this as we get into the Indian materials. So you have to look at the whole darn thing. So below in the text, I mean, and if we're just looking at Ferone, if we were just looking at the effects, then all we would know is that there are some rituals that bestow charm and affection and others that dispel anger. But by looking at the full details, we see so much more. Who are the people? Why are they doing it? What is the point? What are the related rituals with different but similar effects? What are the traditions of rituals? What are the common ritual components that stress up, that stretch across this culture and the cultures they contact with. I mean, honestly, one of the easiest ways to kind of organize a list of magic spells is based on the result. And that's fine, but you have to have the other details of the ritual. Um, there's more to magic than just the effects. There's a cultural history. There's a social history. There's a material culture. There's so much going on in magic. So let's look at one particular magic ritual. Here is the Kestos Hemos. So Kestos Hemos is an adornment or a girdle or maybe a, like maybe like a belly chain or something of Aphrodite, sort of the goddess of love. Now, she uses this Kestos Hemos in one of the earliest uh, descriptions we have of it to repair a ruptured marriage. She takes this magic charm to see her divine mother and divine father were her, who are quarreling, using it to reinstate their marriage. Though she's doing this with ulterior motives based on the Iliad. So the, the weird thing here is that um, in the in the Iliad record and in some of the cognate myths, we don't know what she did with it. Did she give it to her mother? 
to make the father well disposed? Was the father well disposed to her when he looked at her and then he was able, she was able to manipulate him to get their marriage back together? It's unclear. But we have this great example of the kestos himas. Now, when you start thinking about a word or, or an idea like kestos himas, you might think, what the heck am I talking about? Well, there's some good steps uh, in generating sort of definitions and in your initial explorations of any of these sort of foreign cultural con concepts. So the first thing I did to think about the kestos himas was to look in the glossary. We have a glossary at the end of Pharaone. And he writes there that the Kestos Himas is the magical perforated strap that, Afro that Aphrodite lends to Hera in Iliad 14. And later, in later Greek, it is designated simply as a Kestos. So Kestos and Kestos Himas. Also, when I started looking up the word Kestos, I know that it's a Greek word used in the 20th century for women's braziers as well in a brazier company. So there you go. So but do kind of think about that. Something under your clothes, a magic act, it's somehow perforated, so it's got little holes in it. I don't really know what to do with that. So I went to Wikipedia. Why not? Wikipedia is a great place to start. It's a bad place to stop, but it's a good place to start. Wikipedia writes that the Kestos Himas is interpreted as a girdle, a belt, a breastband, and otherwise is one of the erotic accessories of Aphrodite the Greek goddess of love and beauty. All right. Well, Pharaoh was onto something. Aphrodite, erotic accessories, still don't know about the magic. All right. Well, so what I did was then I Googled um, this and I found a, a wiki source on Greek and it says kestos, which I was looking at particular, derived from a Greek term, kenteo, meaning I prick, I goad, I spur on, or I stab, and pos, which is kind of adjectival. So it's something that's embroidered. And as a noun, it is a girdle or a belt. So think about when you embroider something, you're like putting, you're stabbing the needle in and you're making like, I only ever learned to do cross stitch. I never learned to actually embroider. But think about decorating like a leather strap by uh, poking little holes in it. Now, Farone, as we keep reading along, he writes... Kestos means a pattern of perforations or decoration, and Hemos was a narrow strip of leather. So Kestos, meaning like the pokey little holes and designs, and the Hemos is the narrow strip of leather, like a chin strap on a helmet. So through all of that, we're not really sure what the Kestos Hemos is, but we can guess that it is some sort of an amulet type of erotic device that one wears probably below one's clothing, that has a bunch of decorations that are perforations. So from there, I ask, how did I get to all of that? Well, like I said, you know, I don't know Greek. So how did I generate that definition uh, using Greek language data? Well, I just showed you how I did. I looked in the glossary of Pharaone, and I Googled Kestos Hemos, and I found a Wikipedia entry. Then I Googled Kestos, looking for a wiki dictionary for Greek, where I found the etymology. I could have gone further and looked into other Greek things, uh, I could have looked into sort of classical concordances, uh, collections of Greek literature and whatnot, done like a word search on that. But who has time? And I don't know Greek, but I can pretend like I do. So <clears throat> I found a good etymology on that wiki dictionary. And then I found that second definition just in the prose of Pharaone, And I felt pretty comfortable about it. You can do this too. This is especially a useful way to look up a keyword on a topic or in an assignment. So when your professor or your boss, you know, has uh, has you writing something, you know, you notice that there's like this key, really important word. What you can do is you can look it up. And I say, this is your best stop is the Oxford English Dictionary. Look to the Oxford English Dictionary, look at its definition. And here's like the biggest trick for writers. Don't use dictionaries or don't use the thesauruses ever. Never use a thesaurus because you'll get the wrong meanings and stuff. Use dictionaries. If you want to, if you know a word and you're thinking of, you want a different word, look up in a really good dictionary and see the words there and trace it out. And you'll find a better word through the dictionary than through the, uh, than through a, um, what do you call it? Then through, sorry, my phone started ringing and it distracted me. Then through a thesaurus, because thesauruses don't give you enough uh, context in general. Okay, so you've got that, item. then you're on the OED, you've looked at your definition, 
they have an etymology section. What is etymology? The history of words. Then you take your etymology and you do some general Googling from, Googling from the Greek words or the Latin words or whatever words are in that etymology, being sure that when you're Googling generally to evaluate the different sources, you want to find comprehensive, professional, academic, philological, and linguistic information. You want to avoid sensationalist or wild-eyed think pieces on social media or websites. Then you do your little writing and whatnot with the information you have. And then, honestly, go back and read some of those weird sensationalist and wild-eyed think pieces to see how other people are making crazy speculations. And you can use those also in your treatment. So using words in scholarship, it, I find it very satisfying. So... <clears throat> Like with the apples, the thrown apples that would be a goge go rituals that would cause the woman to take it to suffer from Eros or to flee her home and come to the one who cast it. Like with the apples, there's an older folk practice of charms and related amulets that are used by a woman when her husband is angry with her. When he is moody and not communicating. Yeah, go figure. A husband who's moody and not communicating. I think we, we've all observed this in our own contemporary culture. So these charms, these Greek charms, were, were most likely, and linguistically it makes sense, derived from the Assyrian culture of the Near East, so east of the Greeks. They mostly involve tying knots. And those knots are binding magic, magic that binds. And by the action of tying the knot, the anger of the husband is bound. Now, when knot magic is used outside of romance, we see some patterns that emerge sort of across these different cultures. Social inferiors will magically manipulate the anger of a superior, which will increase his goodwill and affections upon the operator. So we have this great Assyrian example right here. The rite is accomplished as follows. You weave together into a single strand the tendons of a gazelle, hemp, and red wool. Then you tie it, tie that woven together thing, for, into 14 knots. Each time you tie a knot, you recite the preceding incantation that's listed in the text. The woman places this cord around her waist, and she will be loved by the one who is the target. Now, if you'll ever notice, there's little black strand on my wrist that has a bunch of knots in it. This is something else. This was a, a protection and blessing cord given to me at a Bhairava temple in Benares in India about 10 years ago. And what's kind of amazing about it is they use synthetic, they use some sort of a synthetic cord or like a nylon cord, and it's lasted all this time protecting me and blessing me. Usually when I go to Hindu temples, they'll give like a red and a yellow rarely black, uh, sometimes white uh, cords that they, they string around your wrist, like a whole bunch of them, and then tie one big knot, those generally break or just fall apart within a month. So that's what that thing is on my on my wrist, if you've ever wondered. Okay, magic rings. So here's a, a great example of a magic ring. A little ring for success and for charm. Charis is the term for charm and for victory, from which we get like charismatic. But charm here is almost like a, a personal magnetism that one will have. So a little ring for success and for charm and for victory. This world has nothing better than this. For when you have it with you, you will always get whatever you ask for from anybody. Sounds pretty great. Besides, it calms the angers, or guy, of kings and masters. Wearing it, whatever you may say to anyone, you will believe, you will be believed and you will be pleasing to everyone. Now, magic rings. I got a lot of these in India as well, but this type of magic ring really does resonate with us. I mean, I, I can imagine having a magic ring. So I wonder why are rings always associated with magic? What was the first magic ring in all these world cultures? Um, there's a great scholar named Wendy Doniger who wrote a book called The Ring of Truth and Other Myths of Sex and Jewelry primarily in, in Indo-European and a lot of Sanskritic sort of Indian cultures that is about rings in which she has such great phrases as the ring rings true. Talk about signet rings and how rings establish identity. It's a wonderful book. Okay, so what else do we see? Facial smearings. So I just got excited. I want to put this greasy faced woman up here. 
because it made me happy. I don't I don't know who she is. So there's an analog to a lot of these philia spells in a sort of later Assyrian facial ointment spell. So you would make this fa this facial ointment, this oil, and you would apply it to a to your face or you or your client's face, and you would apply it there when you're going to meet someone of a superior social standing. So this would make them well disposed to you. Remember this one because you're going to see near exact, near exact examples of this ritual in the Indic materials. You chant this spell three times over good oil. Not bad oil, good oil, expensive oil. You smear your face and your hands. And when you enter in the, into the presence of the prince, he will welcome you. Variant of the text reads, and then he who looks upon you will be glad to see you. So what we're looking at here is these amulets and oils are used to affect the way other people perceive and interact with the person who carries the amulet or is smeared with the goop. So they don't merely carry off anger or danger or evil. They actually request an abstract benefit be granted. Uh, Ferroni writes that in 106, 107. What does he mean by that abstract benefit? It doesn't just take away the anger. It brings forth good feelings in the target. So when we're looking at an amulet, an amulet to restrain danger, to mokatachon, don't know Greek, and a charm to secure favor, charitesion, don't know Greek, and the best charm for gaining victory, niketikon, nike, nike, victory, in the law courts, it even works against kings. No charm is greater. Take a silver tablet and inscribe with a bronze stylus the following... Here's a little Greek amulet in picture. And wear it under your garment and you will be victorious. Maybe victorious. I'd say the victorious here from the context has to do like, like uh, be victorious in a um, in a legal case. Well, yeah, it says right there in the law courts. So when one is making almost a, a political statement or a public statement, trying to convince others. Okay, so perhaps even in this oil thing and amulets, there's a folk practice that hasn't been recorded in which brides would use amulets or these sorts of rituals or even these smearings to ward off future discord in marriage. Maybe it's in particular for these new brides to get a good disposal uh, toward of the husband in general. Or maybe the husband knows it and it has a sort of social effect where he sees her putting on the oil or the amulet and whatnot and then he just by seeing it gets a general better feeling. There's all sorts of uh, cultural implications here. So the conclusion here is that there is then abundant evidence for three types of magical devices in philia, a special ring, a knotted cord, or an ointment that people might use in the hopes of increasing their own personal charm and beauty in the eyes of a husband or a male superior. That's what's up. All right. Love potions. So we have one first example that Farone goes into, and it's about Dianeria's mistake. So Heracles, you may have heard of him before, or Hercules. Heracles brings home a lady after he's been on a long military exhibition. Remember, multiple wives were a thing at this time. And his wife is jealous, finding it rude. So she uses the poisoned blood that she received from a centaur to stain a robe that she then gives to Heracles. Now, the backstory is this centaur was dying. She gets the blood, and it's like last things where whoever touches this blood will become well disposed to you for I will love you forever, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so the robe is given to Heracles. And what it is supposed to do, according to the story, is it's supposed to make him never look at another woman or love another woman as much as as Dianeria. Can't state that name well. Unfortunately, the poison kills him. So that's not good. And when the interpretation comes up of this, it's not considered bad that she used the spell. Not at all. That's not a bad thing. The bad thing is that she miscalculated. And usually the miscalculation is something like, if I put two drops on, he'll love me so much. But if I put, you know, 12 drops on, he'll love me that much more. Unfortunately, there's this subtle problem with these love potions and that often they can kill somebody. So what do we learn on this? And we know that, in fact, she is 
legally punished and legally culpable because she failed to use the right dosage and the wrong dosage killed Heracles, the great hero. So what do we learn from this? We learn that Greek women gave their husbands love potions, probably quite often, but they would only do it in very small doses. So why would they do this love magic? Is it just to get the affection of their husband? Well, we have to remember that there's a widespread patterns in wives who use love magic as they jockey among their competitors for the support and favor of their husbands. So you can imagine if you're in a uh, polyandrous or poly polygamous, polygamous or polyandrous, whatever. If you're in a situation where you have multiple wives or multiple husbands, there's going to be a lot of jockeying and politics for who's going to get the affection of the, the main person. So using magic was one of these ways that they would try to get an edge. And often when we hear reading and when we see readings about this, people who are really good at using these magics are praised for it. People who don't, well, not so much. So there is an old saying that I really quite like that um, Ferrani reported. And it said it's similar to using poisons to kill fish, which renders the fish poison. So this is when you put a poison in the water and the fish would be like, oh, they'd be stunned. And they'd come to the surface and you're like, ha ha, I caught my fish. But then if you eat the fish, you're also eating the poison. Second, secondary predation. Problems, problems of secondary predation. Anyway, so fit, the fish caught in this way will be rendered poisoned. Sort of in the same way, like if you're using all of this magic against your husband, you're going to have a, a stunned, senseless, and crippled man. So that's not a man you want to have. So by too much restricting of his affections and his angers and his sexual desires and whatnot, he is very much unmanned and maybe no longer is all that desirable of a partner. Remember, we always wish to be the one who... We always wish to be the one who loves most, and we often find ourselves in a greater position of power in relationships as the one who loves the least. But if you could artificially make your partner the one who loves you the most, then you would inherently be the one that loves the least, and then you're in that kind of sh shitty situation. Because what do you do when that charming, devil-may-care, super cool, masculine dude? I know I'm just using these just general gender things. When we're, we're talking about Greek culture. Anyway, uh, when, when suddenly he's just like a sad little lapdog. I feel like we've seen this in uh, comedies throughout time, especially in the 20th century. All right. So there's also a widespread anxiety and trope about wives miscalculating the, the portions of the magic and killing their husbands. So we got to see that these anxieties are in light of pharmacons and poisons and love magics being really common and revealing that these are primarily rites and techniques used by women against men. Now, we are going to, we do see many famous men laid low and even killed by this love magic, including the Emperor Caligula, who is thought to be driven mad and then killed by love potions. You can look more into Caligula yourself at some point. So these stories about men being drugged suggest that women ought to be very careful for the great culpability here is giving the wrong dosage, not using the magic in the first place, but using the wrong dosage and doing real damage. Women ought only give the portions in very small calculated amounts. However, the Greek terms in these rituals about emotions are not erotic amorism. They're not just making the husband just want to make love all the time. They have this good disposition. They want to protect the wealth, the family, and the social position of the wife. So in a way, that victim who loves more and is more amorous and favorable is generally going to help the social world of the operator. These aren't just about sexual access. And um, Farana even makes a point that maybe doing these rituals, if you got a cranky husband, could make the whole neighborhood a lot easier to deal with. All right. Uh, oh, no, I have more to talk about. Okay, so we were talking about narcotics and knots. More narcotics. So the amulets, the tainted robes, and the face or, or ointments and potions reflect Greek women as preparers of food, medicine, and clothing. So of course, they're gonna make food, they're gonna make medicine, they're gonna deal with clothing. So of course they have, they have sort of 
uh, a strong dominion over these types of magic contacts and material contacts. So differing from Eros, these rituals of philia are done up close. You are doing them against a single person. And you're not doing it like it's far off or they're unknown. Like an agoge ritual can be done at a great distance. These are close up. These are really close up from something you wear, some the poison, a face I mean, You have to be near in proximity to the person. And the result is not an impassioned madness. So there are philia magic to make all men and all women well disposed to the woman wearing generally. So I said there wasn't a general. There's a few of them. But most of these rituals are all toward a specific person. So we'll note that person being better disposed will make the victim more friendly and affectionate to others as well as the operator. Oh, and here's his quote, doing a sort of service for the whole family and perhaps even the whole neighborhood. So erotic magic, we think of this Eros magic, arrives from a different place than philia magic. Eros magic, when we look at the building blocks of it, it comes out of a tradition of cursing people to have horrible things happen to them. But philia, when we look at these techniques, looks more like the healing arts, looks more like medicine. That said, the writing has a sinister tone. And death by pharmacon philia is kind of a cautionary tale. So it might even be a folk tale to say, you might use these, but be careful. <laughs> um. Men would be concerned, in fact, when they would notice that one other male started being increasingly well-mannered and well-disposed. <laughs> if they suddenly begin renouncing their independent thoughts and acting with unnatural good cheer, there would be the fear that they are under the dominance of philia. So there are some impotence magic tricks. So uh, one deployment of this strap and an amulet will make a man effeminate. And a woman bearing that strap will have no man able to have intercourse with her because he will be impotent. The strap is even engraved in this one instance with an image of a castrated man. So note again, he's not made to feel something in particular by this magic that makes him impotent, but his potency is destroyed and removed. Anger, as I keep saying, is connected to masculinity. Hence, anger is described with terms that mean to swell. One can, we don't have to think too hard to think about male body parts that swell in, in anger and in, um, and in amorousness. Not as much anger, but amorousness. The wife, in fact, by removing his sexual desires, which are thought to be connected also to his anger, removes his sexual desires and his anger, and she unmans him. He is made easier to deal with. His Mediterranean machismo is resolved and is no longer an issue. So in these rituals of potions, there's a lot of manipulation of plants. Now, erotic enhancements such as long erections and whatnot were also known to be affected by irritants. So actually, I've seen this in a bunch of different places that skin irritants and herbal things that kind of aggravate the urethra will be used in uh, will be used in magic procedures towards male sexual enhancement. I've, that's a, I find that in China and India as well. Now, if you take too many of these uh, erotic enhancements, it'll create priapism, a long pain, a long prolonged and painful um, and possibly fatal erection. Now, also, we would see that narcotics are used in these love potions, which would make men more pliable, easier to deal with. But narcotics were thought in small doses, in very small doses, to stimulate the desire for lovemaking. So some pharmacons in small doses will generate passion. But in larger doses, the narcotic will subjugate the, the male victim, even killing him. There's a great chart for this on page 129 that you should take a look over. And that, that'll kind of sum it up really well. So what are our takeaways here? It's really important to study all the steps and all the aspects in magic rituals, not just the results. Philia, in fact, is magic used predominantly by women, specifically used by those in lower social positions to manipulate those in higher social positions. Magic straps, magic rings, 
ointments, magic knots, magic amulets, magic potions are all used to remove both male desires and anger, replacing them with a general docility and amiable behavior. Once again, it challenges men and men's positions in the world, hence all the anxiety. Those potion magics that we saw would often use narcotic substances following a dosage pattern in which a small dose would make a man more affectionate, a large dose would cause general arousal and madness, a very large dose is sleep, paralysis, and death. Over and all again, remember what is the big challenge of magic here? Greek men and Greeks in general valued personal autonomy and personal freedom over all things. And so far, every single ritual we have looked at in the context of Greek erotic magic has undermined the will of the individual and the freedom of the individual and the self-control of the individual. So what is really going on with magic? You're undermining others. You're undermining the freedom for, uh, toward others. In that sense, I mean, some there, there are some arguments out there that what all magic does against another person is you subjugate them. And there is a, a type of magic in India that we'll talk about more called Vashikarana. I do know Sanskrit. And that is specifically subjugation magic. So magic, subjugation, loss of will, dangerous love potions. One heck of a day. All right. See you later.